Hello, so now we are going to discuss our Unit 4, which is about art in Asia. So we are not going to discuss every art that emerged in each country in Asia because that would take so long. Okay, So we are only going to discuss some of the countries in Asia which have like a big contribution to the development of art in Asia. Okay, so let's have a brief introduction to Asian art. So Asia is a vast territory which stands as the world's biggest continent. Considering this factor, one can realize the wide, the wide variety of culture, landscapes, and art forms that can be found in Asia. Asian art flourished in the ancient Mesopotamia or Middle East thousands of years before the existence of Jesus Christ. So around 2500 BCE, another Asian civilization flourished in the Indus Valley which is India now, and then followed by the Chinese civilization by 2200 BCE, so according to Hart Davis, 2012. Most of the art around this time concentrated on religion, narration of events, and architecture. So just like all um, civilizations before, their art is focusing on religion and the narration of everything that they have uh, they, they observe around them, and then, of course, their architecture so let's start with indian art so basically what is indian art so indian art mainly focused on depicting and representing religion so most of their art styles or most of their artworks are representing religion like their myriads of gods and goddesses as well as their rituals so wall carvings paintings songs and literature during its early dates are of course about religion so indian art can be distinguished by its colorful and elaborate details usually telling some background on indian faith and philosophies most of Indian art have Hindu and Buddhist touch to it. But take note, their Buddhist influences are different from the Buddhist influences of Chinese. So although um, they are kind of the same Buddha, but they have different philosophies regarding the teachings of Buddha, okay? So these are examples. So may makikita tayo dito na isang block ng ano to ng wood. So malaking-malaking block siya ng wood. Tapos nandito yung kanilang hundreds of gods and goddesses. Kasi nga yung Indian or yung Hinduism, meron silang 80,000 gods. Okay? So meron silang 80,000 gods or more. Okay? So yun nga makikita natin sa isang village to, eh. sa isang village, meron sila mga pillars of wood and then nakaukit doon yung iba't ibang gods and goddesses nila. Again, pertaining about religion. There are art or yeah their art their paintings their sculptures are most likely to show uh, something about re religion so let let's have another example of sculpture sculpture ito sculpture din ito ayan makikita nyo si Ganesha which is the river goddess in India ayan so god goddess na naman and then we have um uh the incarnates or the avatars of Vishnu so, uh, makikita nyo yon sa color blue na balat. So, according to Indian art, kapag color blue ang kulay ng balat, ito ay either si Vishnu or yung mga incarnations ni Vishnu. Okay? Yung mga avatars ni Vishnu. Ibig sabihin, pag sinabi natin avatars, ito yung, kasi si Vishnu ay isang god, yung avatar niya ay isang tao na sumanib dun yung kaluluwa niya. Okay? So, parang a piece of himself yung tao na yon so demigod yon parang ganun kapag kulay blue yung balat and then we have the indian buddha which is different from the chinese buddha kasi kung mapapansin natin the chinese buddha is fat okay so mataba siya very mataba yung ano chinese buddha pero yung um, indian buddha ito ay mapayat at nakaupo sa ibabaw ng lotus ito ito yon bakit iba yung indian buddha kasi Yung Indian Buddha, nagpo-focus siya sa meditation and spirituality. Ang aim niya is to suppress the earthly desires. Okay? So, isuppress yung, ano, yung mga earthly desires to, ach uh, to achieve nirvana. Okay? To achieve yung kanilang um, enlightenment. Kaya, dahil sa pagtitiis, dahil sa pagtitiis ng mga earthly desires, nangangayat siya. Kasi hindi siya kumakain ng madami, hindi siya sumusobra ng tulog, kaya fit yung katawan niya. Okay? Yun yung paniniwala ng Indian Buddha. Okay, what about their literature? So, Indian literature is basically a reflection of their faith. So, yun nga, katulad din ng ano, visual art nila, yung kanilang literature is mostly about their religion. Most Indian texts are concentrated on religion, mainly Hinduism and Buddhism. The texts are usually about the divinities, rituals, 
moral teachings, and doctrines. The mythology and stories of creation present in Indian literature are also connected to Hinduism, which show pagan faith and animistic perspectives. Pag sinabi natin yung animistic perspectives, ito yung mga sinasamba nila yung mga elements, sinasamba nila yung mga, uh, mga nakikita nila sa environment, like uh, rocks, ganyan, yung water, yung rain, ganyan. Examples of these are the Vedas, the Cloud Messenger, and the Mahabharata. So, ito yung mga, uh, mga sikat na pieces of literature nila. On the moral principle and perspective, Buddhism also shaped Indian literature. Though written uh, doctrines, uh, through written doctrines, moral principles, and spiritual teachings like renunciation of earthly desires such as greed, ignorance will grant one at the end of suffering. So, according to um, Indian literature, kapag ka, um, kapag ka ni-renunciate ni mo or kapag tinakwil mo yung mga earthly desires mo, katulad nga ng greed, ng lust, kumbaga yung seven deadly sins, kapag ka hindi mo yun ginawa, so, mag, doon ka magkakaroon ng attainment ng nirvana. Doon mag, magsisimula na mag-end yung suffering mo. Okay? So, hindi ka na makakaramdam ng pain, hindi ka na makakaramdam ng anything negative kapag ka, um, tinakwil mo yung mga earthly desires or yung seven deadly sins. So, for Indian music, so, nag-prepare ako ng, ano, ng video para maging familiar kayo about the Indian music. Ito yung traditional Indian music. chance na makatugtog yung tatlong musicians. Okay, so these are the three major um, 
traditional musical instruments ng India. So, madali siguro napapakinggan nyo to as background music kapag nanonood kayo ng mga Indian films or mga films sa Bollywood. Okay? So, again, this is their traditional music. So, yun po. Again, yung uh, tinatalakay natin or yung dinidiscuss natin dito ay most likely to be yung mga traditional forms of art ng mga countries na ito. Pero hindi naman nililimit yon dun sa mga na-discuss natin. So, katulad ng sa mga Indian art din, hindi naman uh, yung Indian art ay nag-e-end doon. Marami na rin sila mga art forms ngayon. Meron na rin sila mga, uh, mga animations. Meron na rin sila mga pelikula. Ganyan. Okay? Next is we are going to... Um, jump to Chinese art. So Chinese art has evident arts, uh, evident styles showing Confucianism and Buddhism. So this is again different from the Indian Buddha. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Now we are jumping to Chinese art. Okay. So Chinese art has again evident styles showing from showing Confucianism and Buddhism, which is different from the Indian Buddha. Okay. So which basically entails that Chinese art also valued morality principles along with religion and faith. Chinese art typically use Chinese calligraphy and texts, brevity in nature depictions in literature, and use of local instruments in songs. So, as we all know, Chinese are not the kind of people who like to use parang foreign things. So, as much as possible, they want to use their uh, local instruments. Okay? So, hindi sila nagbabarrow ng mga instruments from other countries. Okay? Most of the time, they are using their own instruments. Okay? So, ano tong brevity na tinatawag dito? Sa kanilang literature or even in other art styles, when you say brevity, this is parang minimalism, okay? So, pa para sa kanila, the more na less yung ginagamit mo, the more na nag-show siya ng skill, okay? So, hindi kailangan na masyadong maraming ek-ek or masyadong maraming mga magagarbong salita or uh, mag masyadong madaming detail sa loob ng painting kung painting man yung ginagamit nila, okay? So, para sa kanila, less is beautiful. That is what we call brevity, okay? So, Chinese art also tend to use local art materials and products to add a certain intricate feel to their own art. Again, more on, they are standing alone. Hindi sila yung nangihiram ng mga instruments. Even their materials are produced in their own country. So, although there are some traces of Indian influences in the Chinese, the Chinese are more influenced by Taoism rather than India's Hinduism. So, basically, their Buddha is more... Uh, in line with Taoism rather than the China, than the India's Hinduism. So yun nga ang mga prevailing na mga ano na mga religion sa China is Confucianism, Taoism, and then Buddhism. So yung Buddhism nila ay closely related to Taoism also. Okay. So ayan, example nila na example ng mga Chinese paintings. Ayan, makikita natin. Ito yung isa sa mga a uh, few na art styles na medyo maraming details pero most of the time katulad nito yun nga less is beautiful para sa kanila and then katulad ganina na sinabi ko the Indian Buddha is different from the Chinese Buddha kan nakita natin kanina na yung Indian Buddha ay payat okay pero yung uh, Chinese Buddha ay ano siya mataba siya so bakit siya mataba kasi yung mga Chinese naniniwala naman sila ang gusto nila kasi yung mga Indians ang gusto nila naman ay kontrolen yung earthly desires para naman dito sa mga Chinese sa kanila naman ay to make or uh, to create an advantage using those earthly desires okay so grab the the opportunity naman sila and they also want to have prosperity and Paano nila mapapakita yung prosperity? Siyempre, kapag ka fat yung belly, ibig sabihin marami nakakain, prosperous yung buhay. Okay? Kaya yung kanilang Buddha ay matataba kasi mas gusto nila na maraming pera, maraming makakain, okay? So maraming tulog, ganyan. Yun yung gusto ng mga Chinese. Kaya yung kanilang Buddha ay mataba kasi prosperous compared to the Indian Buddha na nagko-control ng earthly desires. Kaya nangangayat. Ayan. So ito din mga example ng mga uh, Chinese paintings, and then we have um, the Chinese dragon, which is yun nga, for good luck, and it represents the um, the emperor, and then yung kanilang calligraphy. So, sa kanila nang galing yung ganitong system of writing, na pinanggalingan din ang system of writing ng mga Japanese and then ng mga Koreans. So, 
Their pottery and sculpture dated back as far as 2000 BCE or nung Neolithic period pa. So, earliest tra traces of the Yangshao culture. So, take note, this is not a uh, civilization yet. Hindi pa sila Chinese civilization. Culture pa lang sila. So, nagsimula sila si Yangshao culture of pottery. So, nagkaroon sila ng mga unpainted ceramic jars. Kasi nga, sabi nga natin sa discussion natin, nung, um, nung Stone Age or nung Neolithic period, hindi pa sila yung medyo aesthetic yung sense ng artworks nila. Most uh, most likely puro mga um, utilitarian yung purpose ng kanilang paggawa ng artworks. Kaya, hindi pa nila yung pinipaint. Basta na paglalagyan lang nila ng pagkain, ng tubig, okay na siya. Okay, so hindi nila masyadong pinipaintan. So, unpainted ceramic jars designed with marks pressed using cords. So, yung pinaka design na nila nun ay yung mga cords na pinipress nila dun sa kanila mga ceramic jars. Pero, later on, they evolved into designs of geometric shapes, fish outlines, and human faces outlines. So, katulad nung sa mga uh, early Greeks, nung, ano, nung archaic period sa Greeks, medyo nagkaroon sila ng mga geometric designs and din ng mga animal designs. So, after Yangshao culture, the Chinese progressed to using bronze, jade, porcelain, and terracotta as materials for their ancient pottery and sculpture. They also included more intricate designs in their pottery and sculptures, mostly nature and day-in-the-life events yung nagiging design nila dun sa kanilang pottery. So, after ng, ng Yangshao culture, nung naging full-fledged Chinese civilization na sila, nung mag nagkaroon sila ng mga dynasties, they already explored different materials materials to use in their pottery and sculpture. So, yun nga, nagkaroon sila ng iba't ibang materials at ng mga mamahaling materials as well. Katulad ng jade at ng porcelain. So, yan yung mga example. So, ito ay um, gamit nila dito ay ceramic or ivory. Ito yung galing sa yang Shao culture. So, ceramic ito. Tapos, nagkaroon sila ng mga geometric shapes and then um, parang mga patterns ng fish. And then, ito naman ay gamit nila dito ay Jade. Okay? So, jade sculpture naman siya. So, mamahalin itong mga, mamahalin to itong mga to, mga antique na sila. So, kung makikita natin, yung pottery ng mga Chinese, hindi din sila yung ganun ka ma-design. Kasi nga, brevity yung kanilang pinapairan. So, medyo minimalist yung mga Chinese. Okay? So, we have also yung, ano, yung lion, yung kanilang depiction ng lion. And then, we have the terracotta soldiers. Okay? So, yun po yung mga examples natin for sculpture. So Chinese. What about their calligraphy and literature? So the Chinese actually contributed a lot of um, important details kasi sila yung gumawa ng calligraphy and then ng system of writing na later on sinundan din ng mga sumunod na naging mga powerful kingdom which is yun nga, yung Japan and then yung Korea. Okay, so aside from the oral lore of the Chinese, pag sinaming oral lore, ito yung hindi um, documented through paper, ito yung pinapasa-pasa through word of mouth. So ayun, the earliest account of Chinese literature are the Shi Jing, or a book of cult musical practice. So this is related to religion. Katulad ng iba't ibang mga civilization that existed before, most likely yung kanilang mga earliest forms of art are dire directly linked to religion. So ayun nga, yung Shi Jing ay isang um, cult musical practice. So yung mga kanta nila na related sa religion. And then they have Yi Jing, which is yung divination. So ano to, uh, related to cultivation naman ito. Yung kung paano magte-training yung mga um, yung mga tao to attain spirituality, yung mga controlling ng chi, ganyan. So yung mga ba, yung mga ano, yung mga bad spirit, good spirit, paano nila masusuppress yung bad spirit, paano nila mapapapasok yung good spirit, ganyan. Okay? So, yun, yun. So, and some writings about astronomy and exorcism. So, yun yung mga ano nila, yung mga topics na kanilang literature before. Through thousands of years after uh, these earlier traces, Chinese literature flourished into many forms. So, dati, na lilimit lang yun doon sa mga religious na mga uh, mga divinations and mga musical practice, okay? Pero after noon, ng mga ilang hundreds of years, na-develop na rin ng Chinese kung paano gumawa ng poetry, paano gumawa ng libro, uh, gumawa sila ng mga moral teachings, gumawa na rin sila ng mga batas, gumawa sila ng mga norms, religious rites, and then laws and doctrines, okay? Nagkaroon na sila ng system of writing, and then, after that, nagkaroon na rin sila ng iba't ibang forms of writing na nag-range from very artistic side to very 
uh, practical side, okay? So, yun nga, nagkaroon sila ng mga laws and doctrines and then as well as poetry, okay? So, as for Chinese calligraphy, it is regarded as one of the treasured practices, if not the highest form among Chinese nobility and literacy, along with traditional painting, playing stringed instruments, and playing go. So, this is according to Stanley Baker, 2010. Okay? So, ibig sabihin, yung calligraphy, hindi lahat ng tao sa China ay marunong ng calligraphy. Siguro lahat ay marunong sumulat ng uh, ng characters. Pero hindi lahat marunong mag-calligraphy. Kasi yung calligraphy is some sort of parang, ano eh, uh, an area or a field na kailangan pag-aralan. Hindi lang naman yan basta-basta na paggamit lang ng brush tapos may mga strokes. Even yung strokes pinag-aaralan, kailan yung parang magaan yung stroke mo, kailan yung madiin yung stroke mo, ganyan. So, yun yung uh, tinatawag natin na calligraphy. That's why, yung mga mayayaman lang, Chinese nobility lang, yung nakakapag-aral na calligraphy. Okay? So, ito yung mga examples ng mga quotes ni Confucius, tsaka mga Chinese proverbs, tsaka ni, si Lao Tzu. Okay? Yung gin, mga ano nila, yung mga uh, quotes nila. So, according to Confucius, hold faithfulness and sincerity as first principle. So, this is from the Analects. So, yun nga, faithfulness and Sincerity in everything you do. The man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away small stones. So, in short, ang sinasabi dito ay yung tao na um, successful sa buhay, hindi naman yun kagad-kagad na buong mountain yun napupush niya or naging successful siya agad. Every successful person starts from small steps. Okay? So, number three, respect yourself and others will respect you. Okay, so parang yun nga, keeping integrity in your work, keeping respect sa sarili mo would also make others respect you. Okay? So, number four, he who conquers himself is the mightiest warrior. So, yun nga, kadalasan naman kasi wala ka namang kalaban. Ang kalaban mo lang ay sarili mo. So, in order to surpass your limits, in order to unleash your full potential, you have to, what? Conquer yourself first. Okay, number five, civilize the mind but make savage the body. Ibig sabihin, mag-aral ng maigi, i-cultivate yung mind, i-civilize yung mind, pero yung katawan dapat pinapagalaw din. Hindi pwede na, halimbawa, puro salita lang or puro isip lang, kailangan may gawa din. And lastly, he who works hard gets wealth. He who knows when he has enough is truly rich. Okay? So, yung mga nagsisipag, syempre, nagiging mayaman sila dahil sa pagsisipag nila. Pero, yung tao na alam niya na itong taglay niya ngayon ay sapat na, yun, talo, yun daw talaga yung totoong um, may kaya or maligay sa buhay, according to Lao Tzu. Okay, so ito yung mga example nila. Ito yung kay Confucius, yung kanyang mga analects, yung mga libro niya. Okay, so yan nga itsura ng mga libro noon. So, they start from, sa Chinese, ha? So, nag-start sila sa likod. Nag-start sila sa likod. Sa atin kasi mula sa harap eh. Tapos pa, papunta sa likod. Saka nag-start sila sa likod, papunta sa harap. Okay? Yan yung, ganyan yung orientation nila. So, this is the first page. Okay? Tapos, ang nangyayari is nag narun marunong na rin sila mag-compile ng paper. Kasi before, ang ginagamit lang nila ay eto, yung bamboo. Okay? So, ang ginagamit nila dyan ay yung bamboo. Uh, In-split nila yan. Tapos, nire-refine nila para kuminis. Tapos, tinatahin nila together. Tapos, yun yung nilal nilalagyan nila ng sulat. Okay? So, bamboo. Ito yung mga napapanood sa mga Korean novela. Yung parang tinutupi nila yung bamboo na parang banig. Okay? Pero, nung sumunod ng mga hundreds ng years, na-invent na rin nila sa wakas yung paper. Tapos, nakapag-compile na sila ng mga books. So, parang nangyari yun nga. May mga makakapal na paper sila. Tapos, tinatahi din. Tapos, doon na sila nagsusulat. So, hindi na separate-separate na bamboo yung ginagamit. Okay? So, ito yung example natin ng Chinese calligraphy. Ayan, ito mga to ay mga signatures, mga subscripts, okay, mga red. So, ito nga yung mga calligraphy, ayan. So, hindi lang yan basta-basta na para mga kuris-kuris lang na ginagamit. Talagang pinag-aaralan kung paano yan isulat. Okay, so katulad din ito. Dati kasi parang mga tela-tela lang yung gamit nila eh. Katulad nito. So, mga silk lang yung gamit nila, tsaka wood. Pero, yun nga, naimedo na nila yung papel at yung paggawa ng libro eventually. So, what about the painting? So, during the Tang Dynasty, landscape painting, Shan Shui, became highly developed. These landscapes usually 
monochromatic and sparse were not intended to reproduce exactly the appearance of nature but to evoke an emotion or atmosphere and capture the rhythm of nature so it doesn't really intend to look exactly like the trees or look exactly like the mountains hindi naman parang realism hindi realism yung kanilang intention they just, they just intend to capture the emotion or the atmosphere so somewhat para siyang um, impressionism ang dati and then, and it is uh, monochromatic in color. So, black and white siya kadalasan. But then, after several dynasties, the Chinese opening to painting with added, uh, the Chinese, ano, open to painting with added colors, but in contrast to Japanese painting, the Chinese painting still prevailed in their monochromatic or less colorful painting. Nevertheless, the sophisticated and mysterious field of Chinese painting was still evident. So, actually, the Chinese, although they explored using colors, ganyan, gumagamit sila ng mga kulay, pero they still preferred their monochromatic colors. Or kung gagamit man sila ng mga colors na iba, like mga, mga colorful themes, kung gagamit man sila nun, ang nangyayari is saturated pa rin yung kulay or hindi yung ganun kabongga na may kulay lahat. Yung konting details lang yung may kulay pa rin. Okay? So, hindi naman buong painting ay puno ng colors. Okay? etong Shan Shui, ito yung example nun. Ang ibig sabihin ng Shan Shui sa uh, Chinese, Shan, which is yung ano, mountains, Shui, yun ay, ano, um, tawag nito, water. So, ibig sabihin, halos lahat ng themes na ginagawa nila ay puro nagpapakita ng mountains and ng water. Okay? So, kung makikita nyo yung mga Chinese paintings na monochromatic, Shan Shui, ayan, makikita nyo, puro sila mountains, right? So, ayan, mga trees, and then mountains, and then may mga rivers. Puro ganun yung kanilang uh, themes. Landscape painting talaga sila magaling. Okay, ayan. So, monochromatic, showing uh, rivers, and then very minimalist yung kanilang approach. Ito yung isang example ng ano, Tang Dynasty na, uh, na painting wherein merong use ng colors pero very saturated as you can observe. So, yung color red lang yung matingkad na matingkad pero the rest, although may kulay, is very saturated pa din sila. Okay, and then makikita natin na hindi naman may kulay lahat or hindi matingkad yung kulay ng lahat. So, isa lang yung, isang detail lang yung may matingkad na kulay. Kasi nga, they still prefer their paintings to be very minimalist and uh, having less colors. Now, as for their performing arts, they have a lot of performing arts as well as their musical instruments. Marami din silang local musical instruments. But for their performing arts, this is mainly concentrated on religious uh, rituals or shamanism. Okay? So, parang connecting to the spirits of the world. Ganon. And imperial rites. Pag sinabing imperial rites, ito yung parang mga ritual nila sa pag parang coronation or parang promotion ng isang official. Ganyan. Doon sa palasyo yan nagaganap. Okay? Pag may mga banquets, may mga handaan doon. So, among these rituals are asking for rain or prosperous harvest, or dancing of court ladies. So, nagpa, nagpa, may presentation yung mga court ladies. And music festivals during imperial celebrations. Katulad, name day ng prince, or yun nga, para may birthday yung prince, ganyan. And reenactment of certain events. Okay? So, mga ano, mga, may mga kasal, ganyan, i re yung paano natalo ng, uh, ng emperor yung kalaban, ganun. So, yun yung mga i re nila. Before, okay? Yung traditional performing arts, yun yung mga things. Teams. Pero sa contemporary times, ancient Chinese employed plays that what that was bound by a plot. So later on, hindi na siya basta reenactment or parang ritual asking for rain or whatsoever. Ano nangyari? Gumagawa na rin sila ng sarili nilang mga plot. So gumagawa na sila ng mga play na may mga stories, may mga kwento. They also did mass performances and cross-dressing men in their place in court. So, ibig sabihin, yung mga babae kasi, minsan ka lang makakita ng mga babae na nagpa-perform sa mga place. Kadalasan yon yung mga lalaki, nagbibis babae sila to depict women in their place. Okay? So, this later evolved uh, as traditional Chinese opera or Shichu or Qingchu sa or tawag natin dito ay pecking opera and other kinds of operas. Pecking opera is usually loud and vibrant looking. So, yung kanilang plays 
yung kanilang Peking Opera, yung sikat sa, sikat dun sa China, yung Peking Opera, uh, in contrast with their visual arts or yung kanilang mga painting na very monochromatic, yung Peking Opera naman, very colorful naman siya. Tapos sobrang ingay ng Peking Opera. So, Chinese performance arts also excelled in acrobatics, shadow puppetry, and martial arts. So, ibig sabihin, yung mga play nila, yung mga performing arts nila, hindi lang yun basta-basta parang katulad sa mga napapanood natin na play na may kwento, tapos nagda-dialogue, tapos kumakanta. Hindi lang yun ganon. Yung Chinese performing arts, meron silang in-incorporate na acrobatics, may mga tumatambling-tambling, may mga nag, ano, na may mga contortionist, ganyan. Tapos meron mga nagbabalance ng pinggan, ganon. Tapos meron mga nag-shadow puppetry, and then may mga sword play or martial arts. So let's have this example. Jingju, or Peking Opera, is an ancient performance art with a history of 200 years. Jingju has four kinds of roles, according to different identities and personalities. The lyrics of Jing Ju are performed by singing or rhythmic speaking, accompanied by dozens of musical instruments. Now, Jing Ju still enchants many Chinese people and foreigners with his unique charm. Okay, so that is an example of Chinese performing art or performance art, which is Peking Opera or Qing Tzu. Okay, now we are moving on to Japanese art. So Japanese art mainly focused on emphasizing aesthetic value and nature in its art. Most of Japanese art forms represent and mimic the beauty of nature, be it painting, literature, songs, or architecture. Japanese art is heavily influenced by Chinese art. Some of the techniques and style in Japanese art have Chinese underpinnings, but the Japanese develop their own art sense by making it closer to their landscape in everyday life. Shinto, Japan's native religion, greatly helped in artists or greatly helped artists in Japan to develop their own sense of art. So basically, when we say Japanese art, Japanese art is heavily dependent on nature. So everything, painting, literature, songs, everything is heavily dependent on nature. Laging may uh, may may hint of nature yung Japanese art, okay? So, although yung Japanese art ay originally parang nanggaling pa rin sila sa Chinese art, pero yung mga Japanese, nag-develop na rin sila ng sarili nilang art styles by adapting it 
and mimicking their parang environment. So, instead na shan shui yung ginagamit nila, ang nangyari ay yung mga landscapes na dinidepict nila ay mga cherry blossoms, Mount Fuji, ganyan. So, parang nilocalize nila yung art styles. So, ito yung mga examples, ayan, ng artworks in Japan. You have parang zen gardening, yung pagde-decorate nila ng kanilang gardens, yung paglalagay nila ng mga temples nila, ng mga pagoda nila. Ayan. So, actually, magkaka magkaiba din. Itong ganitong structure, ang tawag dyan pagoda. Ngayon, magkakaiba, or magkaiba yung pagoda ng Japanese and then ng Chinese. Okay? According kasi sa Chinese, yung pagoda, mas malapad, mas powerful. Kasi nga, parang yun nga, palaparan yung labanan. Pero pag sa Japanese naman, pataasan ng pagoda. Okay? So, magkaiba sila. Yung, ano, yung Chinese is horizontal. It shows power horizontally. Mas malawak, mas powerful. Pero oh, sa Japanese pagoda naman, mas sturdy, mas vertical, mas pataas, mas maganda. Okay? So, ayan, mga example din ng kanilang visual arts naman. So, you have ukiyo-e, and then yung mga paintings. And then yung performing arts naman is yung sa geisha. Okay? So, let's start with their uh, sculpture and pottery. The first settlers of Japan, the Jomon people, hindi pa sila civilization ito, Jomon people pa lang sila, named for the cord markings that decorated the surfaces of their clay vessels were nomadic hunter-gatherers who later practiced organized farming and built cities with substantial population. So, they started with, again, nomadic lifestyle and then they settled in one place and then they discovered parang farming. Okay, so nag natuto sila man magtanim, tapos nagkaroon na sila ng agriculture noon. Kaya nagkaroon na sila ng parang a place where they settle. They built simple houses of wood and thatch set into shallow earthen pits to provide warmth from the soil and crafted lavishly decorated pottery, storage vessels, clay figurines called dogu, and crystal jewels. Okay, so nagkaroon na sila ng mga um, pottery na magaganda sa so, na sila ng figurines for protection and then nagkaroon na rin sila ng mga jewels ng mga uh, mga uh, mamahaling mga bato the Japanese mostly used wood metal bronze and ceramics in their sculptures just like other countries in Asia Religion, especially Buddhism and Shinto, has great influence on Japanese sculpture industry. So, most of their um, sculptures, if not pottery, yung mga, ano, util for utilitarian purposes, syempre, for religion purposes yun, which are, of course, um, parang Shinto-related or Buddhism-related. Kasi nga, uh, Chinese, influenced by Chinese sila eh. So, nanggaling dun yung Buddhism. Okay, so yan, example, ito yung influences ng Buddhism sa Japanese sculpture. Makikita nyo, a lot of monks na mukhang Buddha, na mukhang Chinese Buddha. Ito rin ay Kamakura Buddha ata din to. So, kamukha siya ng ano, kamukha siya ng Chinese Buddha. Medyo malaki, medyo sturdy siya, pero um, hindi siya, tawag nito, hindi siya mataba. Malaki, na, malaki siya, pero hindi siya mataba. So, in, in a way, parang iba pa rin siya dun sa Chinese Buddha. And then, we have Japanese um, pottery. Ayan, so makikita natin na very intricate yung designs. And then they use colors. And then ito yung mga, ano, yung mga Buddhism din. Sobrang daming mga sculpture ng mga Buddhist or ng mga Buddhist monks. Hindi ko nakalimutan kung saan lugar to. Basta parang hundreds of them yung makikita doon. And then we have, of course, yung mga kitsune or yung mga Shinto figures, Shinto religion figures dun sa Japan. Okay, so ayan as parang paying homage to the spirits or dun sa mga yokai dun sa lugar. What about their calligraphy and literature? So, ancient Japan was believed to not have any form of writing until the Chinese from the mainland China came to Japan around 5th century. From the Chinese characters, the Japanese formed their own system of writing. From this moment on, the Japanese developed their own distinct literature. So, again, sabi nga natin, the Chinese are the ones who taught the Japanese parang the basics. And then from the basics, the Japanese formed their own um, from, from their own artworks and culture. Okay? So, yun nga, mula doon sa um, Chinese characters, nag-form doon or nag-create yung mga Japanese ng kanilang sariling um, system of writing. Yun nga ngayon, alam natin sa ngayon, na yun nga, yung kanji, yung katakana, and then yung hiragana nila. The earliest literary work that was recorded in Japan is the Kojiki, a record of ancient mythology and songs about the founding of Japan by the gods and how the Japanese people came to be. So, parang ano siya, yung Kojiki, para siyang ano, um, 
compilation ng origin stories. So, starting from the gods, tapos yung pag-aaway ng mga gods, hanggang sa nagkaroon ng uh, Japanese people. Okay? Following the Tokojiki are a lot of aesthetic and mythological histor uh, historical works of literature. One of the most notable works of literature from Japan is Genji Monogatari or the Tale of Genji, which was regarded by some critics as the worst world's first novel, which is actually um, written by a woman. So, ayan, ito yung mga example ng calligraphy ng mga Japanese. Ayan, ito yung mga itsura nila. Kamukha ng mga ng Chinese characters, pero iniba nila to ng konte Okay, so ayan, yung example ng quote kay uh, Tale of Genji, sa Tale of Genji na gawa ni Lady Murasaki Shikibu. Kaso nga lang, hindi makita na takpan. Okay, ayan po. Ayan, so binaba ko na lang siya dito. Tale of Genji or Genji Monogatari. Lost in my sorrows, I never knew months and days were still passing by. Is the year really over and my time too in the world? So parang ito ay isang existential crisis ni uh, ni Genji na ang nangyayari kasi yung lahat ng mga babaeng uh, minamahal niya ay nawawala sa kanya. So, iba yung napapangasawa or namamatay yung mga babaeng mahal niya. Kaya parang uh, nagkakaroon siya ng existential crisis na parang lumilipas ang mga taon pero wala namang nangyayaring maganda sa buhay niya. Ganon. Okay. So, we have painting and woodblock prints. Yung woodblock prints, ito ay nag-originate talaga sa uh, Japan. Ito ay sikat sa kanila. Ang tawag dito ay ukiyo-e. Okay. Painting is one of the oldest and most highly refined of the Japanese visual arts, encompassing a wide variety of genres and styles. As with the history of Japanese arts in general, the long history of Japanese painting exhibits synthesis and competition between native Japanese aesthetics and the adaptation of imported ideas mainly from Chinese painting influences. The most notable form of painting from Japan is their ukiyo-e or woodblock prints which flourished around 17th to 19th century. Okiyo-e usually depicts Japanese beauties, so yung mga magagandang babae, yung theme nila or floral designs, mga landscape designs, yon or even erotica art, okay? So yun yung mga common themes ng Okiyo-e. Tsaka, compared sa Chinese, they are very much welcome to exploring different colors and lively colors. Katulad nga na to, na nakikita natin. So, yun nga, madalas pinipaint nila ay mga babaeng magaganda. Okay? Tsaka, nature. Kasi nga sabi ko nga kanina, yung Japan, mahilig talaga sila sa nature. Laging may, uh, laging may detail na nature. Halimbawa, kahit na Japanese beauties, yung kanilang topic or subject, talagang may dalaga nila ng puno, tsaka na mga laklak sa gilid. Okay? Hindi nawawala yung nature lagi. Okay? Gaya nito. So, ito ay isang example ng yung parang uh, tawag nito, yung parang divider, room divider, yung parang pwede kang pumunta sa likod, magbihes ka, ganon. So, parang ganun yung ito, parang ganun siya. So, ayan, makikita niyo yung pinto. So, nasa side siyang ganon. Para siyang room divider. Okay? Nilalagyan din nila ng painting. Ito naman, nagpapakita naman siya na Chinese influence. Ayan. So, next is we have, yun nga, yung mga depiction naman ng mga gods or ng mga heroes. Kung, mak kung makikita natin, very booming, very lively yung color na ginagamit sa kanila. As well as yung mga, um, para mga stamps. So, makikita natin. Although, um, blue and white, pero yung pagkakapaint nila is matingkad. So, yung mga Japanese, hindi sila ganun ka-afraid na um, gumamit ng colors unlike ng Chinese. So, next is we have yung performing arts nila. So, yung performing arts nila, um, theater din yung ginagamit. Pero meron silang um, apat na kinds ng performing art, which is yung very prevalent, which is yung no, kyogen, bunraku, tsaka yung kabuki. Okay? Pag sinabi natin no, this is a much more elegant and sophisticated uh, performing art compared to the others because of its spirituality and its use of mask. Yung no kasi, this is parang a, a ritual. Ito yung parang seryoso, very solemn yung performance ng no. Itong kyogen naman, ito ay enjoyed by commoners kasi parang siyang sitcom. 
parang play siya na nakakatawa. Medyo may slapstick to. Pag sinabi ng slapstick, yung medyo may kapalpakan element. Yung medyo, alimbawa, uh, babatukan yung isang character. O kaya, medyo, ano, medyo mahina umintindi yung isang character. Medyo bobits siya. So, babatukan siyang ganyan. Or, itutulak siya kasi hindi niya magets yung sinasabi. Or, mga madudula sa sahig. Ganyan. Kaya natatawa yung mga audience. Yun yung tinatawag natin na kyogen. Okay? Bunra ko naman, eto naman yung tinatawag natin na puppet play. So, meron silang mga dolls, traditional dolls ng Japanese, tapos meron silang parang mini theater, tapos yun, uh, nagpa-puppet play sila. Yun yung bunra ko. And yung kabuki naman is some sort of, like, parang peking opera naman ng Japan. Meron siyang uh, music, meron siyang choreography, meron siyang sword play or martial arts, and meron din siyang drama. So, full pack na yung kabuki. And then, they wear uh, very uh, bright and very strong makeup, tsaka costume. Ayan. So, ito yung no- Gumagamit ng mask, again, no. Tapos yung galaw nila is very stiff, very mabagal. Yung kyogen, eto naman, kita nyo, yung mukha ni kuya, sobrang tawang-tawa siya kasi nga, slapstick comedy eto. Okay? Next is kabuki. Ayan, makikita nyo yung makeup, sobrang tindi ng makeup, pati yung costume, kabuki ito. At ito naman yung example ng uh, bunraku. So, meron silang traditional Japanese dolls. Yung mga nakikita natin sa ukay-ukay na ano na Japan-Japan. Tapos, ayan, ginagawa nila is minamanipulate nila yung dolls. Okay? So, let's have an example of a Japanese performing art. Ito ay no.
Okay, so as we have observed in the presentation of No, so makikita natin yung kanilang movement ay sobrang refined, sobrang bagal, talagang calculated. Even the um, uh, musicians, meron silang sinusunod na, na format, hindi sila pwede magsalita lang basta-basta, kailangan kinakanta nila. Okay, and then ang ginagamit din nila na mga, uh, na mga instruments ay very traditional instruments din ng Japan. So makikita natin, ayon na very respected yung form na no. Kasi ito ay um, parang reenactment ng mga stories nila sa Shinto. Yung mga heroes nila, mga gods and goddesses nila. Kaya ito ay very sacred ritual din para sa kanila to perform this. And kung mapapansin ninyo kanina, may mga school na binabanggit. School of no, school of ganito, ganyan. So, bakit may mga schools of no? Kasi nga, yung no, hindi ka basta-basta pwede mag-perform ng no. Kasi nga, this is sacred. So, yun talaga ay pinag-aaralan nila. Meron silang mga formal schools for that. So, para siyang isang course na ititake mo in order for you to participate in a no performance. So, hindi basta-basta na basta mag-perform ka lang ng no. Okay? So, pinag-aaralan siya ng matagal na matagal na panahon. Kaya mapapansin natin, yung mga nagpo-perform kanina, puro mga matatanda na sila kasi sobrang tagal pag-aralan din ng no. Okay? Kasi pina-perfect nila yon. Okay, next we have Korean art. So, Korean art is noted for its traditions in pottery, music, calligraphy, painting, sculpture, and other genres, often marked by the use of bold color, natural forms, precise shape and scale, and surface decoration. Korean art was in speculation that it looks so much like traditional Chinese art, but artists of the day acknowledge that Korean art is an art that is birthed by its country and is containing culture of its people. So, yun nga, there are many speculations about Korean art. Traditional Korean art, ah, kasi yung Korean art ngayon, ang dami na eh. May mga manhwa na, webtoons, tapos yung mga k-drama, k-pop, ganyan. So, nag emerge na yung mga contemporary forms. But when we are talking about traditional Korean art, parang sinasabi kasi ng ibang mga critics ng Korean art, kamukha lang naman yung Chinese art. Kasi nga, for a fact, yung Korea ay heavily influenced by China kasi nga sinakap sila ng China sa loob ng matagal na panahon. Okay? Pero, yun nga, sinasabi din naman ng mga ibang mga, uh, ibang mga artists na yung Korean art, meron naman siya sariling identity. Hindi naman as in ginaya lang niya or hindi naman ibig sabihin na yung traditional Korean art ay kamukhang kamukha ng Chinese traditional art. Okay? So, one thing very elaborate about Korean art is their Pottery. Although most of the ancient Korean paintings are monochromatic in color, their ceramics and pottery stand out. So, yung kanilang painting, dahil nga kagaya sila ng Chinese, closely related sila ng Chinese art, yung kanilang mga paintings ay monochromatic din most of the time or saturated kapag may kulay. Pero yung kanilang pottery is very different from Chinese pottery. So, kung nakita natin yung Chinese pottery kanina, di ba? So, mamahaling mga materials yung gamit pero yung design is very minimalist kasi nga minimalist yung mga Chinese. Pero, yung Koreans, sobrang gaganda ng kanilang mga pottery. So, example nga niyan ay ayan, celadon ito. Ayan. So, nakita natin na very... Ano, very intricate yung design, napaka-fresh tingnan, napakaganda. Ito ay isang antique din galing sa Korea. Okay, so ito naman ang example ng mga paintings nila. Ito, lately, lately na lang nag-emerge din to, pero part pa rin to ng traditional painting nila, wherein gumagamit na sila na very bright colors. Pero dati, yung, as in yung kanilang original na mga paintings ay katulad ng Chinese paintings, wherein, yun nga, gumagamit ng colors, pero highly saturated pa din, kaya nitong dragon na to. Okay, pero itong nga, umusbong din yung painting na um, sila yung gumagamit ng colors din na matitingkad. Katulad ng Japanese. Ayan, example din, Shan Shui. Korean painting ito, pero mukhang Chinese painting nga. Kasi ngayon nga, highly ano din sila eh, highly influenced din sila by the Chinese. Okay, okay. Tapos nakita din natin to yung mga ano na to, mga uh, vases na to. Very intricate din yung mga designs. And then yung shape, kung papansin natin yung shape nila, ng mga pottery nila is unusual. Hindi lang sila basta na, uh, na ginawa. Yung shape nila is unique din. Katulad din itong um, teapot na to, which is an antique din. Gamit pa daw to ng mga tao before, kahit nung hasako pa lang sila ng China. Ganyan na yung mga hugis ng mga pots nila. At saka ng mga kettles nila. Okay? So let's have this example. For pottery. T. 
tea was first brought into Korea in the 7th century. By the 14th century, kings, members of the nobility, and commoners were drinking tea daily. This is Hong Gijin's workshop in Pozong, which is famous for its green tea fields. But now, Pozong Tambongi is looking to become the face of the region. For over 20 years, Song has made Pozong Tambongi using traditional methods from the Choson era. It takes many processes to make a ceramic bowl that meets the standards of a master potter. First, a lump of clay is molded into shape and baked, after which it is covered in a slip and baked for the second time. After applying a glaze, the ceramic is baked for the third time. Normally, the bowl will have a layer of white clay before it is kiln-fired, but chobor tambongi, or literally bisque-fire tambongi, is baked first and then coated with a white slip. Immersing the bowl in the slip is the most delicate process. <laughs> To get one complete piece, Song will shape and reshape the clay many times. Tambong means to dunk something. Chobor Tambongi is made by dunking a bisque fired ceramic in a white slip. Chobor Tambongi is like Chobor and Kimure. Tambongi is a little bit. Chobor Tambongi is a little bit. Chobor Tambongi is a little bit. Tambongiro. 근데 이 덤벙이는 그렇지 않습니다. 조선 사발 자체가 그것은 의도하지 않았기 때문에 그래요. 그 영원성을 그러니까 미적 자아식을 이 포기를 하는 순간 자연으로 돌아가는 겁니다. 자연에는 그 영원성이 있잖아요. 이 조선 사발의 가치는 그 영원성 때문에 그 크게 가치 부여를 하는 거예요. Pottery was immersed in a white slip to give it the appearance of white porcelain. Spreading the virtues of integrity and purity, Neo-Confucianism began to take root in the Joseon dynasty in the 15th century, which was around the time white porcelain, a common fixture in the Ming dynasty, was imported into Joseon. The twin progress of Neo-Confucianism and white porcelain compelled potters to change the look of Puncheong ware to make it resemble white porcelain. The ceramic wares they made were renamed Tombongi. 이 초벌 덤벙이 도자기는 그잘 만들어진 도자기라고는 완벽한 도자기라고는 할 수가 없어요. 
세 번을 가마에 넣어서 구워야만 완성이 되는 도자기. 하지만 사용하면서 어, 물이 들거나 분이 떨어져 나오거나 식기로서는 좀 하자 있는 덤버, 그 도자기라고 할수 있어요. 그런데도 이 초벌 넘버기를 제가 재현하려고 하고 가치를 두는 것은 뭐냐면 우리 선조님들이 만들어낸 독창적 도자 제작 기법이라는 거예요. 우리나라의 역사적으로 만들어졌던 청자, 백자, 분청사기 그리고 흑유자기 이런 것들이 다 중국에서 유입된 도자기입니다. 근데 이 초벌 덤벙이 기법은 중국에는 이 기법이 없어요. 근데 이 기법으로 조선 초기에 만들어졌던 사발이 일본에 건너가서 곳곳 명품이 되어 있습니다. 이것은 이 기법은 반드시 계승이 돼야만 되는 도자기 제작 기법이에요. 그래서 하고 있습니다. The popularity of white porcelain coupled with the inefficiencies of making tombongi led to its quick demise. Only a few tombongi artifacts remain today. 어떤 사람은 세월이 만드는 도자기라고도 표현을 합니다. 그래서 그 다도를 하시는 분들은 이 단봉이 사발을 차에 이렇게 입문을 해서 다도의 경지에 오르기까지 그 과정을 안내해 주는 가장 큰 스승이라고도 이야기를 해요. 그 과정이 있기 때문에 그렇습니다. 점점 아무것도 없는 순진무구한 상태에서 점점 변해가고 쌓여가고 나중에 그것이 엄청난 빛을 바라는 명품으로 변해가는 이 과정 그 과정을 이 덤벙이 사발은 가지고 있어요. For about 500 years, Japanese potters tried to recreate Joseon era tombongi, but failed to make anything equivalent to its beauty. Tombongi embodies fine skills and artisan touch, but above all, a quality that matures with time. Tombongi is made with the technique best described as a method of nothingness. It has a stout stance and retains the spirit of its maker. So Joseon potters were taken to Japan. This Joseon Jungle Funchong Sagi is the last of the Imjin Era. So the Japanese people take our many resources to the Japanese side. The Imjin Era is the war of the Imjin Era. So many scientists go and 자연스럽게 우리의 분청사기가 일본으로 기술이 이전이 되고 장인들이 가면서 일본 사람들한테는 이것이 일본의 다도, 차를 마시는 차완으로서의 기능이 아주 좋다고 판단을 해서 그것이 지금 일본 다도계에서는 아주 유명한 그 국보처럼 돼 있고 Okay, ayan. So, medyo po tol yung um, video kasi ito ay mahabang-mahabang documentary. Okay? So, makikita natin dito, dito sa mga bandang dulo na ng video, we saw that um, Korean pottery is so unique and so valued that the Japanese cannot even create it na katulad ng paggawa ng mga Korean. So, yung mga Koreans, meron silang um, sobrang uh, refined skill in making their pottery na nung Sinubukan ng mga Japanese na gumawa din ng pottery na gaya ng Korean pottery, hindi nila yon magawa, hindi nila yun ma-recreate. Kaya ang nangyari, yung mga Japanese, nung sinakop nila yung Korea, yung mga master potters ng Korea, dinala, ngayon, dinala nila sa Japan as prisoners para sila yung gumawa ng mga... Um, ng mga uh, ceramic ware at sila yung gumawa ng mga... Ano, ng mga ng mga pottery, okay? Kasi hindi nila kayang i-recreate yung pottery ng Korea. So, that only emphasizes how special Korean pottery is, okay? So, kahit na yung um, most of their visual arts ay sinasabi na gaya lang mula sa Chinese or hindi naman originally sa kanila talaga, but their pottery is something that we should really appreciate because yun nga, very special yung kanilang pottery.
Okay, next is we have Filipino art. So, Filipino art, ito, alam na alam naman natin ito dahil mga Filipino tayo. So, Filipino art is a mix of different cultural elements, mainly oriental, which means yun nga, medyo East Asian, Chinese, Japanese, yan, um, influenced by that, and Western influences. Naturally, because yung mga nanakop sa atin ay galing sa West, okay? Filipino art is always heavily influenced with religious background. The traditional and the prehistoric ones were always um, influenced with religious background and local color, okay? So, whether in pre-colonial times or post-colonial times, laging religious or local color yung pinapakita niya, okay? Pag sinabi natin local color, ito yung nagpapakita ng traditional life or rural life or ordinary life ng mga Pilipino, okay? Yun yung, rural, yun yung local color, Filipino art is mostly used in ritual purposes and religious ceremonies during the pre-colonial settings. So, yung mga ninuno natin before, yung mga, ginagawa, mga ginagawa nilang artworks ay closely related to religion, like their music, pang ritual, yung mga sculptures nila, kung hindi utilitarian purposes, ritual din, or mga anito, ganyan. Okay, so yun nga, religious ceremony. So, after the Spanish arrived, the architecture... The sculpture and painting styles in the Philippines greatly changed as this country started to accept more Western influences. So, yun nga, naging halo-halo na yung mga influences sa atin dahil nga maraming nanakop sa atin sa loob ng matagal na panahon. Kaya, unti-unti din na na-influensyahan yung mga artworks natin dito sa Pilipinas. Okay, so ito yung mga example. Ito yung sa pre-colonial. So, yung manunggul jar. Yan, makikita natin din yan. Yung mga examples niyan sa um, National Museum. Uh, ito yung parang mga namamangka din sa um, afterlife dun sa parang river ng ano ng mga uh, namayapa na so yung may mga ferryman and then meron itong manunggol jar kasi pinaglalagyan din ito ng mga uh, ng mga dead okay so dito nilalagay so hindi siya bur burial by ano by paglilibeng so burial siya through putting the dead inside a jar okay so yung manunggal jar and then we have also yung um ifugao houses traditional houses ng mga Pilipino which is yung bahay kubo nga na kung saan gawa ito sa mga um, organic materials so gawa siya sa wood sa mga bamboo or kung ano man yung available na wood and then gawa siya sa mga nipa katulad nga niyan and then suspended siya high above the ground para yung mga animals na pagalagala hindi pumasok sa loob ng bahay okay kaya siya nakaangat and then yung local color na kung tawagin nga yung buhay ng ordinary Filipinos ito makikita natin isang dalagang Pilipina okay na kumukuha ng mangga at saka na, nasa basket and then nasa basket yung kanyang mga pinamili and then of course we have yung mga uh, religious na mga artworks yun nga yung mga relief yung mga rebulto mga imahen at yung mismo simbahan ay isang religious um, influenced artwork so, ayan, ito din yung mga influences ng Western um, Western people, especially yung Spanish, saka yung Mexicans, sila yung nag-influence sa atin ng architecture na gaya nito, lalo na sa mga taga-Norte, kung may mga ilan sa inyo na may probinsya, probinsya sa Norte, makikita kung saan yung bahay. Uh, typical na structure ng lumang bahay doon or ng traditional houses sa uh, uh, north is yung bato, yung baba, tapos kaho yung taas. Okay? Kasi yun nga yung common na structure noong um, unang panahon or nung panahon pa ng mga Espanyol, traditional houses. And then we have also yung ating mga traditional na, um, na musical instruments. So, for our literature and sculpture, um, Philippine literature is a rich collection of historical and cultural stories and accounts. Long before the Spanish have arrived, the pre-colonial Philippines already had a colorful literature from mythology to legends to history, okay? So, kahit na wala pa tayong... Um, parang yung hindi pa masyadong developed yung ating bansa as a whole, pero meron na tayong mga unique na mythologies and legends tsaka mga historical accounts bago pa man dumating yung mga Espanyol. So, the ancient Philippines were influenced by Oriental or East Asian and Austro-Polynesian ideas. But the ancient Filipino created their own mythology by associating them to the things that they can see around them. Okay? So, mga natural phenomena like yun nga, air, water, rain, sky, and stone. So, any mystic nga yung paniniwala natin as Filipinos no pre-colonial times, okay? So, yun yung mga pagan origins ng Filipino art.
Kaya yung ating literature is about, yun nga, mga natural phenomenon, yung mga pag-ulan, bakit umuulan, bakit may alon, sa dagat, ganyan. Because of curiosity, doon nang galing yung uh, ancient literature ng Philippines. So, ayun, medyo mahaba nga ito, pero yun nga, yung kanilang sculpture naman is most likely, nung pre-colonial, ginagamit nila yung sculpture nila for worship, kagaya ng paggawa ng mga anito, at saka pagka-carve ng mga gods and goddesses. So, ang mga materials na ginagamit nila doon ay either wood, stone, or clay. Okay? So, ngayon, nung nagkaroon na ng mga mananakop dito sa Pilipinas, nung dumating na yung mga Espanyol, so, napalitan na karamihan ng mga literature natin. So, most likely, naging mga Christian yung themes about religion pa rin yung themes pero about Catholicism na and then na eradicate na yung mga pagan origins okay tapos ang nangyari is naging Spanish na rin yung salita natin that's why medyo westernized na yung influence sa ating literature what about our sculpture nung dumating yung mga mananakop ang nangyari syempre naging ecclesiastical or naging um highly influenced by the Catholics na yung ating mga sculpture so most likely mga uh, mga um tawag nito mga santo mga um, mga apostol ganyan yung mga nakikita ng mga sculpture na ng panahon na yon okay so ayun po ay yung mga example ng mga prehistoric or rather pre-colonial artworks ito nga yung mga bulol or yung mga anito natin yung ngay manunggol jar yung mga burial jars, and then yung mga uh, mga lalagyan natin ng mga tubig, ganyan, mga pinag-iipunan natin ng tubig, no, na may mga nakakarve pa ng mga ancient writings natin. Okay? So, ito yung mga examples. Ngayon, meron din tayong unique sa atin, pero ito ay simula pa noong um, bago pa dumating yung mga mananakop, ito ay meron na tayo. Okay? So, yung ating um, very rich na um, mga tela, a very rich colored, very creative, very colorful na mga tela na indigenous people natin. So, bago dumating yung mga Kastila, meron na kasi tayong mga groups of people. Ito nga yung ating mga indigenous people na mula noong pre-colonial pre times, nandito na sila talaga. Okay? Ito yung mga traditional cloth, uh, tra traditional clothes nila na winimave nila. Ayan. So, may mga yakan, taylang yakan, taylang, uh, taylang tibuli. Ayan telang maranao, ganyan yung mga itsura nila. Nakadalasan yun yung mga design sa mga malong, ganyan, sa mga kortina ng mga ating mga indigenous people. Okay? And then, yung traditional designs din na meron tayo, yung ating traditional na paggawa ng mga banig, tsaka ng mga basket. Okay? Bago pa man dumating yung mga ano, yung mga um, kastila, marunong tayong gumawa ng banig bilang higaan, marunong tayong gumawa ng mga basket bilang mga lalagyan ng pagkain. Okay, tapos nung dumating naman yung mga Espanyol, naging about Catholicism and Christianity na yung mga sculpture na ginagawa natin dito sa Pilipinas. So, yung Filipino art naging na-convert, naging instead na pagan yung ano, influences, naging Christian na yung mga influences. Okay, ito naman yung architecture sa so makikita natin sa Manila, kasi ngayon Manila yung isa sa mga um, naging parang primary um settlement ng mga Espanyol so makikita natin yung UST isa sa pinaka matatandang building sa buong Pilipinas so makikita natin na heavily influenced by the western architecture as well as ito din yung intramuros kasi nga yung ating mga ano ating mga architecture noong uh, ating mga architecture noong panahon ng pre-colonial ay mga wood yung material. Pero dahil pagdating ng mga Spanish, nagkaroon na ng stones dahil nga yung kanilang mga structure sa Europe ay puro concrete. Dinala nila yung practice na yun dito sa Pilipinas. Kaya naging puro concrete na rin yung ating architecture. Okay? So, meron tayong, um, tawag nito, uh, sculpture. Yung mga sculpture din natin, ayan, contemporary na ito. Ito, katulad yan, nagkaroon na para mga minimalism, iba't ibang art styles na rin ngayon. Meron mga, hu mga human na may naked body, ganyan. Tsaka meron din na parang mga uh, pastiche din ng art styles. Okay? So, nung contemporary times na, nung nagkaroon na ng sariling freedom yung Pilipinas, so, nagkaroon tayo ng iba't ibang art styles and very individualistic na yung mga art styles natin. And when it comes to, um, tawag nito, uh, when it comes to sculpture, okay? Next is we have painting. So, artistic paintings were introduced to Filipinos in the 16th century when the Spaniards used paintings as visual aids for their religious propaganda of spreading Catholicism. Kasi nga, dahil meron tayong parang um, language barrier, kasi nga, hindi pa naman marunong magsalita ng 
Uh, salita natin yung mga Espanyol, hindi rin marunong mag-Espanyol yung mga Pilipino noon. Ano yung naging medium nila uh, for propagating um, Christianity? Ang nangyari doon is, of course, uh, nag-introduce na ng, okay, nag-introduce na ng, um, ng artworks yung mga Spanish, kaya ang ginamit nila yung mga paintings as medium para makapagturo ng Catholicism or ng Christianity. Okay? So, naging visual aids nila itong painting para makapag-convert sila ng mga katutubo into Christianity. Okay? So, these paintings appearing mostly on church walls featured religious figures that appear in Catholic teachings. The purpose of most paintings in the Philippines from the 16th century to the 19th century were to aid the Catholic Church. So just like, kasi sabay ito eh, yung medieval period nung panahon na yun, yun din yung mga panahon na pumunta yung mga, um, yung mga Spaniards dito sa Pilipinas. So dahil nga yung mga medieval paintings noon ay puro about sa Catholic Church, pagpunta ng mga Spanish dito sa Pilipinas noon, puro about sa Catholic Church din yung tinuturo nila. Kaya mostly, mostly yung mga paintings noong panahon na yun ay puro about sa Catholic Church din. Okay? So ayan, medyo mahaba yung ano, Medyo mahaba yung uh, text, okay? Pero uh, to sum up, yung painting natin uh, in the early 19th century hanggang onwards, nagkaroon na tayo ng iba't ibang mga uh, mga subjects for our painting. So, ayun nga, hindi na puro secular art yung, ano, yung pinag-aaralan natin. So, ang nangyari ay um, meron na tayong mga subjects na about landscapes, about Filipino inhabitants, ganyan. So, about Nagkaroon na tayo ng mga jewelry, ng furnitures, ganyan. So, ibig sabihin, hindi na puro about mga santo, hindi na about puro religion yung mga naging subject matter natin for our painting. So, lumawak na rin yung mga subjects ng painting natin, okay? So, hindi na puro about religion. Iba't iba na rin. Yun na nga, na-introduce na yung local color. So, during the World War II, some painters focused their artwork on the effects of the war. So, yun nga. Dahil nga nag nakaranas yung Pilipinas sa matinding gera, yung naging topic or naging subject matter ng mga paintings nung World War II and then post-World War II ay parang puro tungkol sa mga uh, after effects ng gera. Okay? So, common themes included battle scenes, destruction, and the suffering of Filipino people. Kasi ngayon yung napagdaanan ng bansa. Okay, so ito yung mga examples ng mga painting nung nasa under pa tayo ng Spanish rule. Ayan, so very classical, very baroque yung ito. Makikita natin yung influence nito. Kasi ba diba, yung spoliarium, ano ba yung baroque kanina? Sabi natin, ba diba, heavy on chiaroscuro. So makikita natin na very baroque yung, ano, yung influence na to. Very western. Kasi nga, sako pa tayo ng mga western people. And then, of course, painting depicting the conversion ng, ano, ng mga people, ng mga native people and then yung Catholicism nga. So, ito nga, uh, nagkaroon din ng mga painting about people sa mga, ano, sa mga individual people and of course, local color. Later on, nagkaroon na rin ng iba't ibang choices for subject matters, not just about religion. And then now, we have traditional music. So, hindi ko na include yung contemporary music saka modern music natin kasi we all know about that. Pwede nyo naman i-search on your own. But as for traditional music, let's have this example. <music>
All right, so that is an example of Filipino traditional music. So we can get this conclusion na probably before the Spanish arrived in the Philippines, etong mga ganitong tugtog yung talagang music natin, okay? Kasi ito yung mga music ng mga indigenous people, eh. meaning ito yung mga nag-exist na music na pinasa-pasa sa kanila ng mga ninuno nila. Kaya hanggang ngayon, marunong pa sila tumugtog dito. Sadly, yung mga uh, matatanda na kasi yung mga members ng mga indigenous tribes na maalam dun sa mismo kultura nila. Kasi yung may mga kaapo apuan sila. Pero yun nga, medyo contemporary na rin yung isip nila. Kaya parang hindi na rin nila naaral ito. Kaya sadly, yun nga, medyo namamatay na unti-unti yung ating mga traditional na mga uh, mga music tsaka yung mga traditional artworks natin. Okay? Ito din yung isang example naman, kundiman. Ito naman yung traditional music natin nung tayo ay nasakop naman ng mga Espanyol. Sa dilim ng ating gabi, matahini ang simoy ng hangin ay ang malami. Lakas loob ang sayo, namaman na dingdim ang puso ko umaawi. Ang pakiusap ko'y huwag kang magagali. Pagkambala ko sa iyong pananahimi Pagkatang nais ko'y iyo Mababati ikaw lamang Ang tunay kong iniibig Panahuwagan ko sinta Gising at magbangin ka Upang iyong madama ang puso ko nagdurusa. Panawagan kong ito kahit saglit tingin mo upang iyong matanto tulad na Okay, so that is an example of traditional Filipino music nung tayo ay nasasakop pa nung uh, mga Espanyol. Okay, so makikita natin dito yung gamit ng mga musical instruments ay yung gitara, ayan, bandurya, yun nga kung saan yun ay mga invento din or gamit ng mga, um, mga Espanyol. So hiniram natin yun mula sa kanila. Okay, so that ends our discussion about art in Asia. So thank you so much for listening to this um, video lesson.